all of you are ready. Go. Joy to the world. of Advent is the candle of joy and the Menino ladies will light the Advent candles now. When the angel Gabriel told Mary that a special child would be born to her, she was filled with joy. She sang song, a song that began with the words, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Just as the birth of Jesus gave great joy to his mother, so his presence in the world gives great joy to those who believe in him. From hope, peace, love grows joy. We light the candle of joy to remind us that when Jesus is born in us, we have joy, and through him, there will be everlasting joy on earth. Jesus says in John 15, 9 through 11, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Dear Lord, we gather together the spirit sent to of Advent to worship you. We are fortunate this Advent season in a number of ways. We have a beautiful sanctuary in which we can lift our voices to you. We live in a country where we can freely join to worship you. Even the fact that we have our faith is certainly not a given, as there are many who celebrate Christmas without actually knowing you. May this, perhaps, be the year, this Christmas season, that some finally open their hearts to Jesus' love. Now let us come together and say the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, John and Ms. Meninos and Charlie. And welcome to Shutesbury Community Church this morning. It has been a rather hectic morning as Veronica called at 7.30 this morning and said she was ill and would not be here. So we have just been really rushing around like, um, <coughs> like Veronica is in here. <laughs> We do have a few announcements. We do have choir practice after church, and we have play practice after church if the two primary actors in our play make it this morning. They're not here yet. I'm praying they do. I know they have a little bit of reluctance about being in this play, so I hope they're going to make it and, uh, and, and have it ready for next Sunday which, by the way, is Christmas Eve. If you haven't finished your shopping, you might want to get moving because you only got a week left. Uh, uh, next Sunday, we will have a morning service at 9.30 a.m. as always, and we will have our Christmas Eve service at 6.30. Please invite friends, relatives, neighbors, people you meet on the street. Um, stop in at the local, uh, well, the local shopping center and ask people to come and join us for Christmas Eve where we will be celebrating the birth of our dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, January 27th is an important night and I pray that all of you will be free. <coughs> We're going to have a worship and prayer night here at 6.30 p.m. and we are teaming up with the Salvation Army in Greenfield and we'll be bringing lots of music and praise and prayer. And I think it'll be really exciting. And then at the end of the uh, evening of music, et cetera, we will have people staying overnight for what is normally our 12 hours of prayer. We, I mean, 24 hours of prayer. We will have a 12 hours of prayer. And this week, there is no prayer or Bible study. as we will be in the Ellis household having the first of our three Christmas family celebrations on Wednesday night. And it is birthday Sunday. Chris, what key is the birthday songs in? A? That wasn't a C. D? Don't like dog. Okay, thank you. All right, um, it's birthday Sunday, and so we are celebrating today with a, with a dinner downstairs after church, after church and after the rehearsals, um, and we are celebrating Fred Avard and Corrine Beauvais and John Menino Jr., and Carla Foote and Nancy Rustin and Carrie and Ty Ellis. Carrie is our daughter-in-law, and Ty is our grandson. And Nancy Rustin is Anne's brother's wife. So let's sing happy birthday in the way that we do. Yeah? Wow. That is fabulous. Well, we'll throw in a happy birthday there. And I am quite confident that she is having a happy birthday. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I mean. I am confident she's having a happy birthday where she is now. All right, so let's do our birthday song. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. May you have Jesus in every day.
birthday to you. May you have Jesus here every day of the year. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And the best you have ever had. Yay, happy birthday. December birthdays. Thank you. Yes, may the choir come forward for our worship.
Oh, Holy Father. We are so grateful to you this morning that we're able to come here together to praise and worship you, our good and loving Lord. We are just so, so pleased to be able to serve you and love you and show you how much we care for you this morning and to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Now, Anne will complete our prayers, prayers this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you with thankful and grateful hearts. As we are celebrating this season of the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, the solution to the, our failure, the redemption for our sin. And Lord God, your never ending loving plan of salvation. Without the birth of your son, we would be walling around in our own sin and darkness. But Lord, you provided a way, knowing that we could not reach the mark knowing that nothing we did would ever be good enough. And Lord, we just thank you for your plan that stems back to the beginning of the time. You have no beginning and you have no end, but you knew what we would need and you've provided. And you continue to provide. And Lord, I just pray that as we come into the season that celebrates the birth of your son, that our hearts would be filled with awe and wonder. That we would just think about this time and realize that you gave us the ultimate gift, our freedom and our salvation from sin through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. That there is no greater gift on this earth than your son. And because of that, we can come before you with prayers, petitions, thanksgiving. And we have so much to be thankful for. In a world of chaos and turmoil, Lord, you're our anchor. We can find peace and joy. We can look around at this world and know that you are still in control. And that even though we don't like what we're seeing, we know these things have to happen to fulfill the prophecies, to fulfill what needs to happen so that your son, Jesus Christ, can come back. And Lord, we just pray that you will strengthen us as we face the days ahead, as we continue to face turmoil and chaos and uncertainty. And I think that is really one of the biggest things that keeps us bonded in fear. But Lord, you can set us free from that too. And Lord, we just thank you for everything that you've given us, especially wisdom and guidance and direction as we reach out to our families, as we reach out to our friends, and as we start 2024 in reaching out to our community more. And we just pray for wisdom and guidance in that. And Lord, we just pray for all of those here. We pray for friends and family that are in other countries, in Puerto Rico, and Lord, we just thank you that Peggy will be able to go back and visit and spend time with her special um, family down there. I thank you that you have brought my children home safely from other parts of the country with one more to return. Lord, we thank you for um, this time when family does make a greater effort to come together and to celebrate the love that we share Lord, we just pray for our future in you and in your guidance. And Lord, we just pray for your peace to reign during this holiday season. And we love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.
And we will not be singing an offering song because none of us know it. <laughs> Although this is it. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Her Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the peoples, chief priests, and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And after having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Thank you, Peggy. Is this uh, mic on? Oop, we got some ringing. Good morning again to everyone. It has been a crazy morning. It's good to see everybody here that we can continue our 2023 Advent series with Jesus Messiah. 
I told you last week about my friend who had gone to a Bible study in his town for the first time and got into a discussion about whether Jesus is God. And I told you how some of the people in the Bible study seem to um, not be totally sure of that, not be able to grasp that, maybe even to deny that. Well, I heard from him a couple of days ago, and he said that he had gotten a call from one of those people, a woman that he had never met before that Bible study, and that she had called to apologize for arguing with him. And then as they continued their discussion, she told him that he might want to find a Bible study in a different denomination where his beliefs fit better than in this particular Bible study, because her church is a Baptist church, she said, and Baptists don't believe that Jesus is God. Jesus wasn't born of God, but he received his divinity from God later on, so he is not one with the Father, but separate from the Father, a recipient of divinity. Now, I don't know what church this woman is from, But if it's really a Baptist church, she might want to read the church's statement of faith. Because I have a feeling it does not agree with her. And if it does agree with her, then it's not any type of Baptist church that I've ever heard of, nor one that I would want to attend. But it does. Although we are a community church here, and though therefore we are officially non-denominational, We are Baptists both by polity and by affiliation because we are a member of the American Baptist Churches of Massachusetts. And our own statement of faith affirms that Jesus and God are one. We haven't read our statement of faith in a while, so I thought today would be a good time to do that. So if you would read along with me the statement of faith when it comes on the screen. This is from our Constitution and is our statement of faith. There is one God, existing eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. The Bible is the inspired word of God, God breathed, written through human agents, carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is the word intended by God and the the foundation of our faith and practice. All people have sinned earning eternal death, separation from God. And only by grace through personal faith in Jesus Christ can we receive forgiveness and eternal life. Jesus Christ, God with us, was born without human father, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin, rose bodily on the third day, ascended to the Father's right hand, and will return visibly one day to earth. At the end of time, the bodies of the dead will be raised. The redeemed will enter fully into eternal life, amen. The lost into eternal separation from God. As Christ's body, the church, we are accountable to God and one another to live a life separated from sin and filled with the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, and peace, etc from Galatians 5, to 23. It is both our privilege and our duty to join in the fulfillment of Christ's great commission to make disciples of all nations. Every one of those is very, very important, including the last one, which is the hardest, I think. our privilege and our duty to join in the fulfillment of Christ's great commission to make disciples of all nations, which actually means all people who are willing to accept Jesus. It is important, obviously, for all of us to know what we believe, not only personally, but within our church. And it's important that what we believe is what the Bible teaches us, too many Christian denominations today, and all the way back to John, we're studying 
for John in our Bible study, and John wrote the Gospel of John to straighten out some of the beliefs of his time, the very end of the first century, when churches were turning, or individual people were leading others into new churches that didn't believe all of the things that we believe here today. And so this has always been a problem. It's important that we know what we believe and what the churches that we believe and that it's from the Bible directly. And that's why we spend so much time in our services and in our Bible studies examining and discussing God's word. We also should be all, all of us, reading the Bi- and studying the Bible on a regular basis outside of church. And by the way, we do have lots of room in our Bible study on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, on Zoom and in the church, if anyone would like to participate in that. We, are, we really dig into the Word, we dig into it, and we learn so much from it. This morning we're going to look at the third title given to Jesus, Um, at the time of his birth, the title of Messiah. This was such an important concept for the Jews of Jesus' time and for centuries before. The Jews were waiting desperately for a Messiah for centuries to free them from national oppression. And it remains an important concept for Jews today because they, except for Messianic Jews, don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And so they're still waiting for their Messiah. So the Messianic prophecies, the title Messiah, is still important to them. Well, it's also still important to us, but it's important in a different way because we have a Messiah. We have Jesus Christ our Lord, and he is with us. So what's a Messiah? The word Messiah is based on the Hebrew word mashak, which means to anoint. Simple. To anoint. Mashak is used 39 times in the Old Testament in reference to the anointing of priests priests and prophets and kings. David, you might recall, I'm sure, the story when Samuel went down to the home of Jesse in Bethlehem. And he talked to Jesse's seven sons, and he, among the seven, he didn't find the one who would be the king, and they called in David from the fields. And Samuel knew this was the one, and so right then and there, he anointed David as king with oil, even though he wouldn't be king for a number of years after. He was anointed to be king by Samuel. And so this is what was done with prophets, priests, kings at that time. But a few times in the Old Testament, when the word mashak is mentioned, it's a different kind of anointing. It's not the simple anointing of a future king, in David's case, or a priest who's, who's entering into the priesthood. But it's the anointing of one who is not just a priest or a prophet or a king, but who is all three of those, a priest and a prophet and a king. Psalm 45, for example, was written by the sons of Korah. Now, that, they were choral leaders in the, church, in the um, tabernacle when David was king. And David, as you know, was a great writer of music and was a musician. Well, the sons of Korah were assigned to be in charge of the tabernacle music. And so they wrote a number, I think 11, of the psalms that we read in the book of Psalms. And their psalm is about King David. But like so many psalms, it has prophetic undertones. It has within it prophecies looking toward Jesus, the ultimate king in the line of David. So let's take a look at Psalm 45, 4 to 7. It says, In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. 
Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, this is about David on the surface. But notice how in verse 6, the focus changes from the earthly King David to the heavenly King Jesus when it says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. This is pointing to a future Messiah whose scepter of justice, it says, will be the scepter of your kingdom. There are many prophecies that are similar to this that point directly to Jesus as the anointed king and savior of the world. Interestingly, only one of them actually uses the word Messiah, which in Hebrew is Mashiach, and means the anointed one. So only one time, one prophecy in the Old Testament has the word Messiah in it, the anointed one. And that's Daniel 9, 25 to 26. And that says, know and understand this. We got that up? Maybe not. I'll just read it to you. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. Kind of sounds like what we're heading toward today, doesn't it? Could be. In any case, we're not going to take the time this morning to analyze this prophecy. It's obviously very complicated and requires a really deep understanding of the Old Testament history as well as an understanding of apocalyptic writings. But it's enough for our purposes to know that the anointed one mentioned here is the future Messiah, who is Jesus. And the rebuilding of Jerusalem that is mentioned here was done upon the return of the Jews from exile in Babylon between 500 and 400 B.C. One, oh, wait a minute. The arrival of the anointed one is seven sevens and 62 sevens later. Now, scholars have computed that to be 483 years. I have no idea how they did that. But that's what they computed that to, and it refers to the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. So Isaiah, writing at the time, I mean, excuse me, Daniel, writing from... um, exile in Babylon prophecies the return of the Israelites to Jerusalem to rebuild that city which we know happened between 500 and 400 BC and he also prophesied 483 years later the arrival of the Messiah Jesus Christ. Now, in the New Testament, the Greek word that means the anointed one is Christu, and it's used for, nearly, uh, for Jesus nearly 550 times, because it's how we refer to, to Jesus, Jesus the Christ, Christu, the Christ. But it also means the anointed one. It's the exact uh, translation of the anointed one in Hebrew. Now, in the NIV, which is what we use, the majority of those cases of when this Christu is used, it's translated as Christ. But for some reason, 74 times 
it is translated as Messiah. This is at the discretion, uh, discretion of the translators, of course, because it means it's the same thing. Messiah, Christ, Christu, um, it all means the same exact thing. So it doesn't matter, so the, new King, the King James Version doesn't have the word Messiah in it at all. It says Christ, 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 Christ every time. But in the New International Version, it's 74 times translated out of about 550 as Messiah. So we can read it either way. But why is it important that we understand about the Messiah and that we believe in Jesus as the Messiah? And that's what we come to with our, our friend's Bible study. Why is it important that we know that Jesus is the anointed one of God, the Son of God, God himself, that God and Jesus are one? Well, it's important because God provided through the prophets literally hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament about the future coming of the Messiah. More than 350 prophecies of Jesus are in the Old Testament. So God obviously wants us to know that, or he wouldn't have put 350 prophecies in there. Here's a few of them. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, as you know, means God with us. An appropriate name for Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Numbers 24, 17a says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. There's that scepter again that we read in Daniel. And there's that star that we read about in Matthew when he talks about the Magi coming from the east following a star. Jesus Christ is the scepter that rises. And isn't Jesus Christ the star? It's his star, but he is the star. Jesus Christ Superstar, remember that, that movie, that musical way back when, which I don't particularly like, though a few of the songs are really good. Isaiah 11, 1 to 4a. A shoot will come up from the stump of G Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. The just, with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Now this, this could be a prophecy about David, right? About the king. A shoot coming up from the stump of Jesse. Because David was certainly that. He was Jesse's son. But it can't be because Isaiah lived long after David lived. And so it points to a new David. And the new David is our King Jesus Christ. And then there's the most famous prophecy. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7a. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. It was beautiful, just beautiful writing beautiful explanation of a beautiful Savior. The reason God so wants us to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, I believe, is really simple. Really simple. The Apostle John tells us why in chapter 20 of his Gospel. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples in the house where they were hiding out. Remember after after the resurrection, I mean, after um, 
Jesus died on the cross, they went and they hid. And Jesus rises from the grave and he appears to the disciples in the house. And he went up to Thomas, who had earlier said he would not believe that Jesus had risen unless he actually saw the holes in his hands from the nails on the cross. And Jesus said, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and belief. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then John, the author, interjects into this story. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And that is the simple truth right there. The simple truth from John. By believing, you may have life in his name. God did not create us with the intention of having us die and go into the Netherlands, wherever that, you know, Sheol of the Old Testament. He created us so that we would be with him for all eternity. And he sent Jesus to bring that message and to tell us there's one way to do it. One way. Believe in Jesus as Messiah, and you will have life in his name. So understand this if you understand nothing else about the Bible. If it is your belief in Jesus that brings you to everlasting life, Acts 4.12 states it this way. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. No other name, not a single one. It's that simple and it's that important. Believe in Jesus and have everlasting life. Such is the promise and glory of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who is our Messiah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, We are so grateful that you sent Jesus to us. Lord Jesus, we are just so grateful that you came and walked upon this earth, that you condescended to come down from your royal place, from the glory of heaven, and walk upon this earth where there is so much trauma and difficulty and pain and heartache and so much temptation and so much pulling at our souls. And you did that, and yet remain perfect because only perfection would resolve the sin of us. And so you went upon the cross, the perfect sacrifice, and gave yourself that we might have everlasting life with you. We praise you, O Holy One. And we love you. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our final song this morning is Not a Door, which is the one that was planned, but we switched off. And I don't remember what it is, but we'll find out when I get back down to the piano. Stand up for this one. Go tell it on the 
To all who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And now may you go in peace, carrying the love of Jesus in your heart and sharing it with all whom you meet. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.